Hi everyone, I'm back and today the topic for discussion is the lessons to be learned and you might ask the question about what? About intracranial pressure monitoring and a mishap. Yes, things can go wrong, so they don't always go right. Here is the case of Nurse J. She is assigned to a patient with intracranial pressure monitoring. This patient looks very comfortable. Everything is coasting along nicely. ICP is 12, which is per perfectly normal. She has what is got called an EVD, an external ventricular device connected where the fluid drains out. There's some ports connected along the way and it drains into a system and it's usually measured every hour and the ICPs are recorded. It's three o'clock in the morning. She goes to her patient to hang an IV piggyback. It's unfortunate that she connects the medication to one of those ports. That is very sad news. What could she have done differently? I really don't know what her situation could have been. Maybe more lights in the room, taking the time to look at each port carefully, feel it, ass assess exactly where it was and which direction it was going. These are just some helpful suggestions. Now, the next one, good outcomes, and that is so much easier to have to deal with. Intracranial pressure monitoring is rather complex, and it's for to fully appreciate it, you need to be in an intensive care. However, this is the case of the nurse who was placed in a very difficult situation. Her patient's ICP was really high. This was a trauma patient. Ice brain was full of swelling. And she had to do make use of her critical thinking and made and was extremely vigilant, made some very wise decisions. She limited the number of visitors at the bedside, which even though I know it would be nice, it doesn't do very much for the brain. It actually gives the brain more work to do more oxygen, which is not very good for already damaged brain. And then she staggered her activities. Instead of trying to be task oriented where she suctioned and turned and got everything done all at the same time. She would suction, give it a few minutes, turn, give it a few minutes, and staggering the activities really paid off. This patient had excellent outcomes and progressed very well. Here are two questions. What is an abdominal aortic aneurysm? What's an aneurysm in general anyway? Let's start with the abdominal aortic aneurysm. First of all, what is the aorta? Well, it's the one of the largest. It is, it is the largest blood vessel in the body. Actually, it's very powerful. I've seen a patient where there was rupture and the blood just went flying to the ceiling. That's the power of the arterial blood in that particular vessel. And it carries oxygen-rich blood. It passes through the chest and abdomen, then divides up to supply the body, the blood to the legs, as you can see in that um, illustration there. An aneurysm is a bulge or balloon in the wall of a blood vessel. The majority of aortic aneurysms occur in the abdominal area, but may also occur elsewhere along the blood vessels that divide after leaving the abdominal area, like the iliac artery. What you have here is a literal bulge, and you don't just get that in the abdomen. A patient can also have a, the same sort of bulge within the brain, and then it ruptures and that leads to something like a subarachnoid hemorrhage. And there is a case study at DearNurses.com on a subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can learn more about brain injuries. It sounds intimidating, but it really isn't. When you get to learn more about situations like this, it is rather interesting. And it's really, it really helps you advance your learning curve. Have a nice night.